be discussing uh, the California solar mandate and yeah, well, quite a bit more on uh, the regulatory environment and updates that are going to be taking place here uh, in the really in the next few weeks. Uh, it's kind of an exciting time to be in solar, and I'm excited to be joined by Bill Brooks from Brooks Engineering, and uh, and so we can start getting into this. Uh, and I hope you enjoy this lecture, and, and feel free to uh, you know use the chat line for questions. And uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end. All right, uh, let's get to the next slide. So just in our agenda today, we'll be uh, just introducing the companies and uh, then we'll get into this kind of a newsworthy thing. It's attracted a lot of attention, the 2020 California Solar Mandate uh, coming down the line. Uh, uh, enforceable, really, in the next couple of weeks uh, after January 1st, 2020. And that may bring about some opportunities for training, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but then the meat of the presentation today will be on uh, changes in the National Electrical Code and, uh, and other regulatory changes on the federal and state level that are affecting our PV system installations. Uh, but no worries, uh, in 2020, Solus has got a rapid shutdown solutions, uh, a number of solutions for our contracts to, to choose from. And uh, you can easily achieve the California Solar Mandate compliance with Solus, and we'll talk about the different ways you can do that. So with that, uh, let me just introduce uh, Solus. Uh, we are an international company, a global company. Um, and uh, Brooks Engineering, who has uh, uh, been working in the solar business here in the United States and, in, and abroad for over 30 years. Uh, Jinlong Solus is a global manufacturer. We uh, are a publicly traded company, uh, recently listed on the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, and uh, you can see our factory there. We are the factory. We're expanding that factory. Uh, almost doubling it uh, coming up here in 2020. And of course you can see PV all over the roof. Uh, I love that. And uh, we are the first Chinese PV string inverter to have achieved that UL 1741 back in 2009. So we've been here a while, uh, certified around the world, and uh, generally in a, a well-recognized Asian brand uh, in the top three in, in different markets, uh, India uh, and in Europe. So here in the U.S., though, we've done our due diligence and uh, we've had our lifetime analysis done by DNVGL and, uh, and our reliability testing by PVEL. Uh, it's good to get these kind of documents in place. It provides confidence to our uh, customers and distributors and uh, we can provide these kinds of uh, reports to ensure that you could uh, your confidence in the in the U.S. product uh, from a, this global manufacturer. Uh, but what we really are uh, one of the things that we're, we're, we think of as a product for the U.S. is our service. Uh, we've really developed a new uh, service infrastructure. It's U.S. based, but it really is now spread through our company company wide, worldwide. And you can do online ticketing. You can do tracking. Uh, there's excellent metrics for response time. Um, and we have a local team, an in-country team for uh, execution of all of your uh, RMA or ticket issues or troubleshooting with any of your systems. Uh, um, I'm kind of proud of the library we have online for and of videos and app notes and things like that to help you get through any issues you might have with the systems. And, and if we're not around, you can talk to our, our, our uh, our bot online, and, and you can even submit tickets to that. Good access. Um, now, I just wanted to mention the three-phase products. I think the much of what we're going to be re, kind of using as examples today will be the uh, single-phase products, but I did want to show you that uh, 125, we just come out with that. Um, 20 uh, inputs, uh, string monitoring, uh, some really cool things like IV scan functions and uh, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, our three-phase products uh, for CNI, uh, they all are kind of famous for that four MPPTs. Uh, but uh, I really want to get to our residential products. On the next slide, I think that those are the ones that are really going to be uh, the products that we'll see integrated into much of the mandates uh, that the 
California builders are going to be uh, subject to. And, and I guess the range is quite notable from 2.5 to 10, um, all integrated with a PLC signal generator now um, and uh, SunSpec ModVest uh, certified. Uh, it's known as a reliable grid support inverter today. Uh, next slide shows uh, another product we have, and that's the hybrid. We are uh, supply hybrid inverters around the world and, uh, and again, provide a wide range of products. Uh, our 5K, for example, can accept uh, as little as a 2K, or even a 1.5K of PV, so you can put in very small systems, small battery sets, and uh, comply uh, to the mandate very quickly. Uh, uh, of course, just like our regular grid tie inverters, this includes a built-in transmitter for rapid shutdown, all NEMA 4X enclosures for all these products. Uh, and then our last group of products that we sell are communication. Uh, we kind of, we have that Wi-Fi stick and then this new cellular stick, really very touch safe install, kind of cool. And our new rapid shutdown product, you'll note, uh, this works with our own, what we're calling a universal PLC signal ch transmitter in our inverters because not only does it send the, a proprietary signal to our own product with a 10-year warranty, but we can also uh, have it transmit a SunSpec uh, type signal so it can communicate with other products in the rapid shutdown universe uh, here in the United States. Uh, and with that, I'd kind of like to turn it over to Bill. Uh, Bill is, uh, you know, from a uh, long time in the industry. Bill, let's talk a little bit about the products you're offering into the, into the market today. Okay, uh, can you hear me? I can. Good. Well, uh, good morning and afternoon, everyone. Um, um, Bill Brooks, Brooks Engineering. And uh, as Terrence mentioned, I've been in this field for over 31 years and uh, uh, been a consultant for about that long, helped start the North Carolina Solar Center in 1988, um, and was there for 10 years. Moved here in uh, California in 1998 when California started their rebate program. Mm -hmm. um, I installed the first system in my community and um, did a lot of, uh, I've done a lot of training, was really the only trainer in California for several years doing grid tide training uh, and then a bunch of people got involved and so I've been involved in consulting utility interconnection issues, helped establish a lot of the rules that are out there for utility interconnection. Uh, Rule 21 in California was the tech facilitator for that and uh, also oversaw the inverter list for about eight or nine years uh, for the state of California. Uh, which approved all the inverters um, that were able to be used in California, which was kind of a de facto list for the country. Um, done a lot of training, uh, nearly 20,000 uh, inspectors, installers, and electricians over the years. Um, and then uh, also done a lot of uh, manuals and articles, uh, just uh, finishing up an article for the IAI magazine, the International Association of Electrical Inspectors, uh, that'll get published in the uh, March April edition talking about interconnection of uh, um, grid tie inverters with battery backup and um, uh, electric vehicles and things like that and uh, I'm on code making panel for the National Electrical Code and we oversee uh, of course all the solar articles 690 and 691 which is large scale and then 692 and 94 which is fuel cells and wind uh, and then interconnected power sources, 705, which is, uh, I was involved in a complete rewrite of that article for the 2020 code, and then article 710 on standalone systems. So that's just a little rundown. Uh, I've got about 300 clients over the 15 years that I've been operating as Brooks Engineering, um, and uh, happy to work with uh, Jim Lon Solis. Well, we're sure glad to have you on this lecture. It's going to help I think our audience understands some of the issues and how they tie together uh, and how they can ensure that their systems are, are in full compliance. Uh, but really this newsworthy thing is really what attracted me uh, and really got me focused on some of the new changes that are happening. And, and as, as I note, uh, the CALSA is going to be giving a lecture on the 220, uh, 2020 California solar mandate tomorrow. 
and uh, and and uh, well, that's they're charging some money for that lecture if you're not a member. But uh, this one, y'all get for free. So <laughs> I hope it's. I think it's going to be more than worth it. <laughs> Um, so this is just a, you see this chart a lot when you look up or Google California solar mandate. They're, they're anticipating something like a 10% bump. You can see uh, that there is a substantial uh, uh, home building in California in, in every year. It's quite, I, I, would, I didn't realize 120,000 almost single family homes will be installed, uh, put in in California. And they're anticipating that almost 50% uh, at least will, will comply with this new mandate. That's a lot of extra solar being installed. And we find that to be quite interesting and, and maybe something that all of the PV contractors today can, can take advantage of. But uh, we're thinking maybe this is going to bring in some other folks as well. Uh, the next slide shows uh, that we think that not only PV contractors and even the big guys like uh, Sunrun and Vivint who work with these builders are going to get interested, but we think the builders themselves might also start to get interested in solar power. I mean, I couldn't ask for more, right, Bill? I mean, uh, uh, we would love it, it to see that, you know, roofing companies are getting uh, involved in uh, ensuring that roofing warranties are in place after PVs and, and, and that, you know, standardization and packages uh, by home builders are, are uh, uh, let's say, put in together with energy efficiency measures and uh, really coming up with a kind of a new, better home. And uh, this, this new mandate has allowed for both purchase, loans, or leases of these systems. So there's, it's kind of open as to how um, these companies can interact with and, and fulfill their requirements under the mandate. But really what has happened, and it's, 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 don't think of it as some sort of mandate that's come down from on high. Really what's happened here is that the building energy efficiency standard has changed. It has been updated from the 2016 and now the 2019 uh, California building energy efficiency standard will be in effect. And so this is where the mandate is and, and where it came from. It's really not just about putting solar on homes, it's about really reducing greenhouse gases uh, in California about, and about uh, really developing a new standard for energy efficient homes in California. And I think there's a possibility here that this may even uh, bring about the return of passive solar architecture, which would be lovely. Uh, you know, better energy efficient homes, uh, really even neighborhoods may be laid out so that they're more amenable to a PV system access uh, solar access, as we say. Uh, so I think it's kind of exciting and potentially could bring about some new uh, opportunities for training in the industry, uh, not only for PV system contractors, but also some of the trades that are involved in home construction today. Um, sales folks for the home builders will need to really learn the game. They'll have to learn how to sell a solar system. I think that there'll be some, you know, they're being asked to put in maybe 10,000 in, in capital costs and uh, that's going to add maybe 40 bucks a month to the, to the uh, mortgage, that sort of thing. But, but with all the energy efficiency measures in place, they should save at least $80 over uh, 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 similar homes uh, without solar or these energy efficiency measures. So uh, there's some attraction for this. And uh, solar starter packages, I think, will be attractive to these home builders who are used to kind of upselling things. And I think the modularity of PV systems will be attractive to some of these sales folks because indeed you can start out small and build on that. So not only will there be sales training, and I think uh, groups like SCI you know, do uh, PV sales training uh, in addition to others, but uh, I think there'll also be need for training in the, in the home builder trades, that is electricians and, uh, and roofers. In the next slide, uh, uh, you know, this sort of training has been taking place for a long, long time in ensuring that uh, the IBW, for example, is up to speed on all the changes in, in solar and other parts of the code. Bill has been doing a lot of this work, and, and we're worried that maybe PV system complexity will seem like a barrier, and so that kind of training will be required. And so I think access to effective training is critical for the success uh, for these home builders who are getting into the market and 
for uh, always PD system contractors know this already with their uh, CE credits for NABCEP and other things. Bill, uh, what do you think about this training opportunity coming up here in the 2020s? Yeah, I think uh, definitely there's, there's going to be a need for training. I think also um, what this is going to do, the mandate will certainly raise the water on all ships. And, mm. and uh, there's probably about 20 to 25 percent of all new home starts in California already have solar on them. So we already know that there's a lot of interest in this area. And um, having had my power out for four days where I live, um, recently because of wildfire concerns. Um, there's also a real interest uh, right now in California for what we call the all-electric lifestyle. So it's not an all-electric house, it's actually an all-electric lifestyle where basically not only does your house, is your he house heated and cooled with uh, heat pumps and things like that, all electric, but uh, both your cars are also electric. And uh, that requires a pretty good sized PV system. It requires a fairly complex system, uh, very smart. And uh, that's where the future is going. So, um, you know, the, the setup and the training and the software and everything that goes into those things are, are going to be a major part of the next uh, decade. Indeed. I believe that too. Uh, because we're not only talking about uh, equipment. Uh, in the old days when I was installing, we would see the meter spinning and that would be the end of the job uh, and I could ask for my check but today really the owners of these systems want to see their system on the internet they want to see it functioning they want to see it communicating with them and so that's a big part of PV systems going into the 2020 is not only their functionality but also their capability to communicate with not only their customer but with the grid. So there's quite a few uh, changes in the National Electrical Code and in federal and state regs to ensure this new uh, communicative and grid stabilizing uh, distributed resources like our PV systems. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to start out with this stack. I like this. I got this stack. I'm not too sure where I got it, but Bill, I like using this because it, it kind of just shows the interoperability of, uh, of all these and kind of how they work together. You can see on the bottom are those local codes for, you know, like maybe a AHJ wants you to install a battery system just so, you know, and then there's the state codes like Rule 21. And then you move up to the national codes like uh, the electrical code or, or the FERC uh, orders. And then up above that is the testing uh, and certifications that you get to meet to ensure that the standards, which remember don't have any inherent authority themselves, but the, the testing to those, they sort of set the guidance uh, for the testing that's done to ensure that customers are getting what they're paying for. Bill? Yeah, this is, this is a nice slide to summarize a lot of that stuff and just the understanding that uh, it does flow up or down, however you want to see it, uh, mm -hmm. from the local jurisdiction. Ultimately, wherever you're installing this, that's where the rules start, uh, but it's going to very quickly flow up through the process. So um, the, the local uh, jurisdiction is enforcing rules that are often regional or statewide. And those right. statewide rules are, are working off of national requirements, the National right. Electrical Code uh, yeah. being the most universally adopted code in the United States. Um, and then we have our building codes. And so we have the residential building codes and California has their own version of it, but it's exactly, you know, pretty much the same, the California building code uh, and the California yeah. residential code, the California electrical code are based upon these same codes. Um, the adoption cycle for California is a little bit different than others, um, as well as New York State. So two of the largest states in the country and Florida all have adoption cycles that are somewhat delayed. Um, and part of it has to do with the largeness of the bureaucracies and all that. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, the products and the, uh, uh, the equipment has to meet uh, test standards. And those test standards are... are uh, UL test standards. The UL provides or sets the requirements um, as part of a standards technical process and a standards technical panel. And I sit on most of the standards technical panels related to PV inverters and uh, modules and all the like. 
uh, and rack systems and things like that. Uh, but uh, those test standards um, are developed through UL, um, but uh, and then certified with a, a, a variety of different certification agencies to that UL standard. So when we talk about things being UL certified, that's not really the correct terminology. It's certified to a UL standard. It might uh, UL might have done the certification. Intertech may have done the certification. CSA, TUV, uh, Met Labs. There's, there's several different labs around the country that do the actual certification verification. And in the next slide, uh, really, we're starting to get into really some of the terms and 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 phrasing and numbers and other things that you're going to start to see. And one of them might be this 2030.5 standard. Now, this is a it's a communication method, remember. And what we're trying to get to here, I think, is you've got a utility out there, and it needs to communicate with these distributed resources. And essentially, what and it needs a language that it can a common language that it can use. And so that SunSpec, you can think of as kind of that language, and you can think of the common smart inverter profile as just uh, the the person the the equipment that the utility is talking to. So the utility needs a language and it needs something to talk to. And indeed, that's kind of what's being formed here. Bill. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. And so, indeed, oh, okay. those, hey, yeah, I wanted to go from that yeah, to so, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about. Um, uh, the NEC and, and how that process goes. Obviously, the National Electrical Code is the most relevant code to photovoltaic systems because they're electrical systems. However, uh, the building codes have gotten on uh, into the process starting in the 2012 building code series uh, and up to the present. Uh, this is a the most recent um, uh, map of the United States for uh, the adoption of the National Electrical Code, everything in gray is on the 2017 code. You'll see the California is still in pink because until the end of this year, uh, we're on the 2014 code. And then when we adopt what is called the 2019 California Electrical Code, that includes the 2017 uh, right. National Electrical Code. And so, uh, and you'll see that New York is, of course, on the 2014 code, and so is Florida. They're in the process of adopting at various levels. Uh, and so the adoption process is kind of not haphazard, but not uniform, mm -hmm. uh, certainly. And then uh, uh, Massachusetts is the first state in the country to adopt um, the, uh, the current version of the National Electrical Code, partly because NSPA is located in Quincy, Massachusetts. And so I guess they have some pull in the state there. Um, and uh, also military bases uh, and, and territories the United States also can take on the, the latest version of the code at the adoption phase, which would be January 1 of 2020. Uh, so this gives you a really good idea. In fact, this, this is published by NEMA. That's the National Electrical Manufacturers Association. Mm -hmm. And you can Google NEMA NEC adoption map at any time, and they will they basically update this thing almost monthly, especially this time of year. Uh, they'll adopt, they'll, uh, in about two weeks, they'll uh, update it again, showing California on the 2017 code. And uh, you'll get to see, and then there's an explanation paragraph that goes below that, uh, which we don't have on our screen here, uh, that goes into the details about some of that adoption cycle and all, uh, which is very helpful um, uh, to know when these things are coming down the pike. Right. So the next slide is getting into um, the 2017 NEC and uh, the 2020 code. Now we just published the 2020 code a couple of months ago. Uh, the 2017 code was a pretty large uh, shift. I was heavily involved in the in the reorganization and rewriting of um, the 2017 Article 690. Uh, where we pared down Article 690 from about 11,000 words to 8,000 words, which is a pretty massive change. Um, 
At the same time, we also had a lot of new detail added in the rapid shutdown area. So we yeah, look at how far added. I had to zoom out to get this photograph, yeah. Bill. <laughs> <laughs> to see it. Yep, that's about 1,100 words. So there's lots of detail in there. And so for folks, that, especially folks that live that work in California and other other jurisdictions that are on the 2014 code, you're in for a new experience. Uh, there's a lot more detail in there. Um, and uh, also, we took out all the information about DC loads, standalone systems, battery storage systems that historically always been part of 690, and we put them in their own article. So now we have energy storage systems, which is 706. We have standalone systems, which is 710. And then we have a new section of uh, Article 705 for microgrids. Uh, obviously, microgrids are becoming uh, very much in the news and a lot of discussion about those um, because of uh, power outages and things like that. Right. And, uh, and microgrids certainly offer a lot of uh, really interesting things. And that became a, a separate part of Article 705. Um, and we could have a microgrid that could be as small as a house. And we could have a microgrid that could be a neighborhood or it could even be a small downtown area of a city. So uh, microgrids are going to become something that's really interesting. And then there's a whole new area called DC microgrids, which is essentially direct current versions of those things. Um, which right now we see mostly in manufacturing and all, but we will see those um, in the built environment in the next uh, decade or so. And all that stuff was removed from 690. So um, yeah, 690.12b2 is really where everybody's got, uh, where all the interest is. And uh, starting in January of this year, uh, the, there was a delayed enforcement of requirements specifically related to uh, reducing the hazard of the electrical circuits within a solar array. So previous to that, uh, we have, we've had rules in the 2014 code and 2017 code for reducing the voltage outside the array to 30 volts in 30 seconds. And those rules continue to be there. Um, but then we have new rules about inside the array to reduce hazards, not to the same levels as outside the array, um, but to still pretty stringent uh, hazard control levels, uh, the most common of which is highlighted there in number two, to curtail the voltage or to segment the voltage in the array down to no more than 80 volts within the array uh, when the rapid shutdown uh, switch is initiated. So when we push the button or flip the switch for the rapid shutdown system, um, most systems out there today, if not all, are going to reduce the voltage in the array down to 80 volts. And then outside the array, of course, will be down to 30 volts. And all that will have to happen in 30 seconds. Um, there is coming up uh, some other options. You see option one and option three. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those. If we have a specialized rapid shutdown array, which is we've used a little bit different term than that in the 2020 code. Uh, that's going to be one compliance option that will be available in the next year. Uh, and then there are definitely folks out there considering building integrated systems uh, that don't use any metal parts and don't have any exposed wiring and, a, and, all, and the entire system is more than eight feet from grounded metal uh, as, a, as a third alternative to meeting these hazard requirements. Okay, so this is related to the first option that we saw on the last slide, a listed PV array. The terminology that we're using in the UL standard is um, the PV hazard control system. And so a PV hazard control system is a um, set of requirements that include the uh, modules, the equipment, um, the wiring methods and all that, are, that go into a system that place that system in a uh, safer condition when the rapid shutdown switch is initiated. Um, and that is a fully listed process. Uh, that standard is being uh, completed right now. It's in the comments stage, those comments. In fact, there was a meeting this morning. Uh, I've been a couple meetings this week dealing with comments on that. And then it will be uh, voted on in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then uh, hopefully sometime in the first quarter of 
of uh, 2020, we'll have that as an established standard and products will begin to be certified to it. And I would expect somewhere in Q2 and Q3 of next year that we'll see products uh, listed to this new hazard control standard. That's interesting stuff, Bill. Um, today we're under the UL uh, 990, I think it is 991 for the uh, safety uh, of the rapid shutdown devices and we would move to that new UL standard? Not necessarily. So, um, hmm. so UL 1741 has an annex that references UL 990 um, or 991 um, for that's a, um, a fail, uh, a, a fail safe safety standard. And so hmm. it has to do with the electronics. So the all equipment that is uh, used for the 2017 and 2020 code for rapid shutdown is required to be listed uh, as rapid shutdown equipment. So all the outputs and inputs of inverters, for instance, uh, any kind of optimizers or switches used in the array, um, those type of devices all have to be listed uh, for rapid shutdown. For instance, the Solus um, rapid shutdown box, um, that all gets listed to UL 1741 um, Annex. There's an Annex specifically for rapid shutdown equipment. Um, that, that standard will continue to be used as the standard for any type of module level electronics equipment uh, okay. for the foreseeable future. Sometime in the future, it is possible that we'll end up um, uh, essentially folding that annex of 1741 into this new 3741. It's oh, okay. certainly 3741 right now is referencing the 1741 annex. Right. Uh, yeah. But over time, those things will, you know, the, the attempt is to try to make this as straightforward as possible for the installer as well as the enforcer trying to figure out what is required. Excellent. Uh, now, I wanted to also follow that up with uh, this FERC order 841. Woohoo, another Fed regulation, right? But uh, I do want you to take a look at that little chart down at the bottom there. Does that say energy store market will surpass 100 billion? <laughs> I mean, that is insane. We are going to see a real boom in storage. And part of that is because the national government has. Uh, incentivized or at least given us more clarity on the value of storage kilowatt hours. You can see that basically what it's come down to is that there is value for the actual kilowatt hours and there is value for those ancillary uh, uh, capabilities that storage can provide for the grid and smoothing and, and stabilization and that sort of thing. So just having that new order that that really uh, affects these wholesale electricity markets is, is a giant incentive for putting in so, uh, storage systems into PV coming in the 2020s. So yeah, on a big, you know, on a national level, this is happening, but it really is going to be affecting decisions that you make in your neighborhood. Um, and while we're on batteries, I did want to just mention that 690.12 does not apply to batteries. So uh, you need to especially, I think, check with your local rules on the installation of batteries, especially in the next year or two. Uh, there's, look on the bottom there, you can see that the Contractor State Licensing Board recently uh, voted to limit uh, energy storage system installations for C46 contractors. This is, a, this is, you know, it's being contested, and, and so we're seeing some real local things happening with the installation of batteries as it becomes so much more popular. And so uh, just understand that when you're doing shutdown, uh, these rules for rapid shutdown in the code uh, referencing PV boundaries and these sort of things do not apply to battery sets. So just check that out. Um, I wanted, you know, we went through a lot, of, we went all the way up that stack and back down again to the local level. And I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that um, in the PV industry, we, we really have a lot of great resources. Uh, Bill, the solar ABCs, uh, are they, they're uh, still online, right? Uh, yeah, so, so this is uh, just to give people an idea of what's going on. Um, the solar ABCs was uh, funded by the Department of Energy for about seven or eight years, which is about the longest 
the Department of Energy has funded anything in its history. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, unfortunately, all good things end up, you know, come to an end uh, because it's part of the, the way the government operates. And so, uh, the good news is we've been able to keep those resources still online uh, at the website, solarabcs.org. Um, and um, actually, it's not in here, but it, I should have added it. Um, I work with an organization uh, or a, a process called SolSmart, and that's S-O-L-S-M-A-R-T, SolSmart. Mm -hmm. And you can go to soulsmart.org. And um, although it's not a one-for-one -one, uh, replacement of what Solar ABC does, did, it's, it's a process whereby local communities can become certified as solar friendly, is basically what it is. And it requires a variety of things uh, in their permitting processes and their zoning processes and things like that. And there are uh, quite a bit of training resources and I'm uh, a tech, I'm technical assistant with that. Uh, SolSmart is uh, administered through the Solar Foundation um, and so uh, that's that's something that uh, is is available today. And there are over 350 communities around the country uh, that uh, are are essentially uh, certified as Soul Smart communities. Also, we have um, you know PV industry, academics, and uh, inspector communities all involved. We're encouraged to you know obviously yeah. continue to work with the NEC process. Um, but we still operate what we call the PV Industry Forum, and that's a combination of an organization that I helped start called the PV Industry Code Council and the Solar Energy Industries Association, mm -hmm. and we've been working together over the last uh, code cycle or so, um, and we've got probably around 250 different folks that, that uh, are engaged in that process and probably 50 or 60 of which are actively engaged in that process, helping put together proposals for the National Electrical Code and for the residential building, the residential code, the building code, and um, the uh, fire code. So there was quite a bit of activity as we uh, just wrapped up the 2021 uh, code cycle for the building code. Some very interesting and important uh, decisions were made on residential battery systems and where they're allowed to be installed and how they have to be installed and things like that. So when we're talking about energy storage, it turns out that the building code is by far the more relevant code to battery storage systems because there are restrictions on where you can install them. Um, and everything, for instance, one, one thing to be aware of is that all energy storage systems that are installed inside of a residence must be UL 9540 listed, which is there's only about half a dozen companies in the world that have that listing. And so um, that's so it's something to be, to be aware of uh, when we talk about the hybrid products that, that uh, Solus is working with. Uh, they have two partners that have UL 9540 devices, uh, LG Chem, and uh, well, they're actually UL 1973 devices that can become part of a 9540 system, LG Chem and right. BYD. Right, right, right. And in the next slide, it shows uh, uh, just some the banners for CALSA. And I, I encourage you to join. As I noted, they're, they're highly involved uh, in the mandate and how it's ad how it's administered for example uh, smud made a proposal for a kind of a different way to to administer the program and and calso was the one that that got the bodies in the room to uh talk about give the solar perspective on that and uh that that particular proposal was turned down but uh we're going to see some other pushback and calso is your voice as installers to uh, help organize for a particular uh, mandate or or a particular regulation that's going on down. So please think of them as a, as a resource and consider joining their their uh, group uh, to get involved in what's going on in solar, not only on the on the ground and on the install level, but in the uh, regulatory and compliance world. So they're a great resource. Yeah, yeah. Just to second that, um, 
definitely. Uh, um, if you're working in California, they are an excellent organization. They they are really carrying the water on these issues in a very effective way with a very effective staff, and um, they're they're worthy of your support. Uh, I help them out um, quite a bit, uh, just pro bono, a lot of pro bono work because they're they're worth it. And um, so I think so too. Uh, I would encourage you if you're working in this in this community uh, to support Calsa. They're, they're doing, they have been very effective. Um, and um, quite frankly, uh, the utilities in California are uh, not necessarily all that friendly towards mm -hmm. solar at the moment. Um, it, it's not a, you know, the environment is, is, is not hostile, but it's, it's, it certainly requires a lot of interaction. Uh, and without CALSA, we would not be in a good situation right now. And we got to still push for better uh, regulations, better tariffs, things like that. Indeed. So I want to uh, start the last part of this lecture and talking a little bit about how, well, first we'll talk about module level shutdown to meet the NEC 2017 code that we showed you earlier in the lecture. And so on the next slide, you can see the new module level shutdown product from Solus. And it comes in a one input or two input uh, prods a device, of course, it's uh, uh, certified to 991 uh, and uh, and meets the NEC 2017 uh, 690.12 regulations B22, uh, as we highlighted in that slide earlier. And you can see down the bottom there, it's a PLC heartbeat, and actually that's our proprietary uh, uh, signal going to our our own uh, manufactured product, the the new shutdown device. Uh, we've recently run it through its paces. It's a 10 millisecond uh, operation in the inverter, but about nine seconds for it to shut down uh, the array. Um, and of course, this is linked to the transmitter that's inside of the inverter. And so for a PV string inverter setup like this, it, it really is just these two parts. It's the, the inverter with the integrated PLC signal generator, or it can be external, of course, as well. But uh, uh, in the case for Solus, it's integrated, and, and then the device is out on the roof itself. And you can see in our particular case, we're putting two in modules to each device and then wiring the devices together. In the next slide, um, you can see kind of shows a bit of our compatibility, our capability to work with other products out on the market. And that's sort of the message that we're giving to installers here if you need a 25 year solution, our universal transmitter, we're calling it because it can do both our own proprietary signal and to our 10 year warranted product, kind of a nice 10 year warranted bundle there, uh, one company, one warranty. And then you have uh, a company that's able to work with EP Smart, for example, they have a 25 year warranty. This is, you would install one on each module here. And this is a nice, way for you know installers and distributors who are putting out equipment solus is a nice inverter to use because now you can pretty much have your choice of of suspect uh, 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 man uh, i'm sorry suspect devices uh, that operate with that communication protocol so here is the ap smart device in the next one, you can see how really it's such a simple install. Essentially, you're just installing the inverter and, and maybe putting one of these devices on every module before you lift it to the roof and then installing as normal. There's really hardly any change in labor requirements to install rapid shutdown in these systems. Here's an interesting device. It looks very much like the uh, uh, AP Smart device. It's a company called Z Run Technologies Electronics. I'm sorry, and uh, they have some really interesting uh, technology. Actually, they are uh, 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 have been customers of uh, many well-known PV module uh, companies. But on the next slide, it's really interesting why we're interested in Z Run is they have purchased the Maxim technology. This is a chip maker in the United States, and they purchased this. Uh, Maxim was working on a silicon carbide chip that would replace the diode and act as the optimizer. And now you're really talking about reduction of labor and of failure points, many uh, fewer 
uh, MC4 connectors on the roof and excellent performance when you are doing optimization on the cell string level. So we're quite interested in following this company uh, and indeed they are compatible with our module level rapid shutdown uh, and their devices today. And uh, we're looking forward to maybe seeing something like this in the future. And speaking of uh, module JBox solutions, everybody's familiar with Tygo and they've upped their game recently with a new uh, rapid shutdown, uh, a retrofit device, very quick to install. And now they can't, we, our transmitter doesn't necessarily work with their gateways and things. So you'll have an external transmitter that will uh, speak with their gateway on the roof and then provide the kind of, well, all, all kinds of functionality, including long strings and optimization and uh, monitoring on a string, on a module level. Uh, really, Tiger does it all. Um, and this is where we're kind of yeah. trying to get to, right, Bill? This is what this, we this, had, this uh, the, does, yeah. yeah, this is the new signage, and it's so important. Bill, go ahead. Yeah, this is a, this is a sign that uh, is near and dear to my heart. I did the graphics on this sign, <laughs> All right. so I, I tell you what. Uh, well, you know, if uh, you, you give me a set of crayons, I can, <laughs> I can do you some graphics. This is some good um, lines, Bill. But anyway. Uh, th this is a, th there's a lot of stories behind this sign, but uh, basically this is talking about the signage related to rapid shutdown. Um, and so all the new, new systems that are being installed on buildings, again, rapid shutdown is only for buildings, never for ground mounted systems or carports or anything like that. It's really, it's for roof mounted systems, systems on uh, buildings that are occupied by people. And so, um, so that's really the focus. And so this, this uh, uh, sign here basically just lets people know that when they operate the rapid shutdown uh, switch and turn it to the off position, that then they're gonna shut down the PV system. And in the process of doing that, they're gonna reduce the hazard within the array, which is a new thing, again, starting 20, uh, January 1 of 2019, the requirements for inside the array. And the color of the sign is yellow because it's a caution. It's not a, uh, it's not a danger situation. It's a caution situation, but it is trying to get people's attention. Uh, and so this very simple sign uh, was intended to communicate to firefighters. And so that's why we call them solar electric PV panels. Um, those would not be the terms that are used in the electrical code at all. Uh, or with knowledgeable people in the solar industry. We call them modules and we call them arrays, uh, but nobody else in the world does. And so uh, that's why we, we call, call them what people call them and that solar electric PV panels. I think most, uh, most firefighters can understand what that means. Whereas if you, if you call something a PV array or a PV module, they would look at you like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Hmm. So, um, Anyway, that's just a little history behind that sign, but these are the signs that would be on every uh, building that had a rapid shutdown system. So let's uh, close out this lecture with some of the uh, regulatory compliance uh, uh, marks and uh, certifications that have been, that you'll see on SOLUS equipment to give you that warm and fuzzy feeling that this equipment complies with the latest and you'll see both grid tie inverters and hybrid inverters from Solus uh, that can meet uh, these regulatory changes and the 2020 solar mandate. Uh, in the next slide, we have kind of a list of marks that you might see actually on your inverter. You can, on that lower left, lower right hand box, you see sort of that small, hard to read list of, of uh, certifications, but indeed you should check these out and make sure that you have not only IEEE 1547, which is really about, uh, you know, grid reliability and managing and stability and that sort of thing, but also 1547.1, which starts to talk about these new smart inverter functions and the testing that has to go along with that. Um, you should always make sure that your latest inverters have that 1741 SA mark on their on the inverter to ensure that you know these inverters have been tested for these support functions and and that uh, 
uh, for example, those uh, that ancillary services that these inverters will be pro uh, providing using their batteries and uh, commands from the grid. Um, so you wanna make sure that's there. On your uh, rapid shutdown device, you're gonna see that UL-991 uh, device today. And, and in many cases, you'll see that inverters are marked with a SunSpec logo or, uh, or may even have an IEEE 2039 <laughs> Uh, mark on them, but you might not necessarily see those, but the, for certainly those top four. And in the yeah. Next, it's, yeah. It's, it's important to, to help people understand that you're not going to see these standards uh, listed on the label necessarily. Some products okay. might have them on there. Uh, the listing label uh, will have a, a series of, of numbers and uh, maybe a, a, a a report number or something like that that you'd be referencing and then there's there should be technical support and possibly documentation from the manufacturer that goes into the details of these certifications um, also something to be aware of is that california is updating their inverter list i believe january 1 and they will be wiping their entire inverter list and replacing it with a whole new list of the UL1741 SA compliant grid support inverters. And so you need to be aware of that, that you should uh, download these lists, uh, make sure you have uh, those lists and make sure that whatever products you're working with are compliant with uh, whatever the latest lists are. So. Excellent. Anyway, I, I interrupted you about 2030 and you can talk about the, uh, the communication standard there, so. Yeah, I mean, those are those international the standards that we're all being tested to, but there's also national regulations. You won't see these marks really on your equipment either, but I did, you know, you do want to, you know, we're adding this new level of safety to these PV systems and every all of our installers now are confirming that uh, that they meet that 2017 code after January 1st. So, uh, you know, you want to make sure that your both your inverter is capable of operating with these new module level devices or it cannot be installed. So although you're not gonna see, you know, NEC 690.12B22 or 21 or whatever it ends up being on your inverter, uh, you do have to follow that reg, of course. And then uh, just, it's not something you have to follow, but it's a new regulatory uh, environment for batteries uh, given this new FERC order. So, um, all of you who are considering, um, you know, new PV system installations in 2020 and beyond should start to think about those battery systems. And, um, you know, that, that FERC order actually has already gone into effect. It went into effect in, in December uh, this month, actually. So uh, you can start. Yeah, something to add right. to that, uh, just to add to that context of the FERC order um, in battery storage, was yeah. really driving battery storage in California are the electric rates, the tariffs. Right, right. And so uh, the FERC order is very helpful to, to essentially make the utilities a little more friendly uh, toward us uh, because there is kind of the strong arm of the law telling the utilities <laughs> uh, that they should put together favorable environments for uh, storage batteries, which is great. And that's yeah. excellent. Um, the, what's really driving the economics in California is the fact that uh, we have a pretty big spread in the cost of electricity uh, from basically 3 to 7 p.m. Uh, versus off-peak. That's considered on-peak in the summertime versus off-peak. And so now you're starting to get into the, the, the position where uh, you really need the energy storage to yeah. store your excess solar in the morning because you're not getting enough uh, benefit for that. Uh, and I, I, I know this uh, firsthand. Uh, mm. So I, I have two houses. My first house that I installed the very first system in my community 21 years ago just went off of its flat rate. And now it's on this time of use rate. And so my son who lives there now, um, we had to put batteries on his house oh. to actually make the structure work for him. And so uh, there, there is a very real need for battery storage systems at all levels, uh, you know, except for maybe very small systems, we're gonna be putting in energy storage. And it's uh, not unlike what happened in Hawaii, where in Hawaii, uh, the utilities changed the regulations pretty, pretty radically 
And overnight, it birthed the battery storage industry in Hawaii. Yes. We're seeing a big industry growing here. And a new area that I'm exceedingly interested in, which is called vehicle to grid. And uh, which has been around, the, the, the concept is, uh, but we're just now hearing uh, people talking about making it part of the interconnection standards of electric vehicles. Uh, I just purchased electric vehicle this last week. I'm pretty excited about it. 64 right. kilowatt hour battery in my car. Um, you know, we're only going to be able to afford maybe a 10 or 15, 20 kilowatt hour battery in a house. But if we can add to it a 60 some kilowatt hour battery in our car during uh, power outages, that's a pretty attractive world that we're moving into. So anyway, back to you, Karen. No, that's a great addition. And indeed, it talks about a little bit about how things are changing and adapting to new technologies. And, uh, you know, Go Solar California is is where, I, I believe that where that list is, right, Bill? That's what uh, that you're talking to that they're gonna wipe. And so you got that, uh, link there that you can check out and and indeed you need to make sure that as bill said you need to make sure your inverters are on these lists you need to make sure it's on the cec list you get very you know that you they're famous for giving you that efficiency number and then the go solar uh, uh california dot uh ca dot gov list to ensure that you've got rule 21 compliant inverters there um other marks you might see on the inverter uh, might include that iso ne that's this is speaks to how different parts of the country are, are engaging with and learning about and setting rules for interconnection into their grids. Uh, on the West Coast, of course, it's Rule 21. And, uh, and you might, as I noted earlier, you wanna check it out, check out those contractor state licensing board to ensure that you know, you're getting the latest information on energy storage system installation. So there's a lot of state codes. So we're kind of boiling it down from those uh, uh, international standards down to the national, regs down to the state codes and laws. And then finally, on this next slide, we see the uh, tie right back to the California solar mandate and those local building codes that have changed, you know, now that we're into this new 2019 Title 24 Part 6 Building Energy Efficient Standard. You know, there's calculators out there. You can see that latest standard. I gave you the link there. But really, this is how it kind of all ties back to, you know, everything's local. And so, uh, the mandate is going to be an interesting new local state uh, regulatory change. It's going to drive some interesting new changes in the industry. And the next slide shows, I think, kind of a warm and fuzzy for me anyway, that the, that the guys that I think are going to be affected by this, which is the California Building Industry Association, they're, they're seeing how this new 2019, and I'm probably seeing that 21 code or, or, or teasings of it, Bill, uh, and how energy efficiency and how statewide building standards are really taking a leap forward. And I think it's also cool that they're recognizing how CEC is working with them to, you know, to make sure that if they do dive into this battery storage thing that they're going in the right direction. So I'll just close out with a, a short summary how Solus you know, we, we provide a complete solution and it, basically that's your install right there one inverter and and six PV modules and uh, and three rapid shutdown devices and you are in compliance for very inexpensively the mod the solar solus modules can uh, solus uh, inverters can take a very low voltage at high efficiency our complexity as you can see is relatively low there and we think that's going to be attractive to new uh, folks that are putting together packages to meet this mandate are, are uh, priced very competitively here in the United States. And because of the few parts can be installed quite quickly. And I think that the closer for us is that we can bring uh, services and training to these uh, PV system contractors that are putting in these new communicative PV systems and the trades that are getting into PV uh, because of these new changes in the building code. We think it's a bright future for solar and uh, especially for Solus uh, going forward to meet these, uh, this very challenging U.S. regulatory environment. And, and we look forward to uh, hearing some of the questions and, uh, and some of the comments about these new changes and uh, about the systems that we're going to be putting in. Hey, Terrence and Bill. Terrence and Bill, we got some questions here. Uh, what is the minimum solar size required? 
Well, it's done by a calculator uh, that's based on the square footage in your home and where you're located. And so I've run through the calculator a number of times on a couple of websites and it looks to me as though there's not a real minimum size. Uh, if your house is very tiny, it could, it could be a 1.5K array, truthfully. But a lot of them seem to be coming in, you know, for a typical California home somewhere around about 2.5 to 6, somewhere in that area. And another question. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Oh yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, California has kind of uh, been a big um, pusher of what we call the tiny house. And so, yeah, if you had a tiny house, uh, you could have a system might be as small as one kilowatt. So I don't know that there's any minimum minimum uh, other than how how much room does it take to house a person, and then <laughs> it goes up from there based on uh, you know. I guess a doghouse uh, might might be uh, a one module project. So anyway, <laughs> and then um, uh, Vincent Bartlett asks, I thought that some builders are going to put in four solar panels. Well, that that could a, possibly be if yeah. if they met the requirements. Um, and uh, and again, I think that CBIA statement is that with energy storage and all, there may be an opportunity. Um, you know, remember that's over a kilowatt. Uh, might be a kilowatt and a half, and you know, with some modules out there. So uh, again, you'd have to run the calculator. It would absolutely depend on where it's located uh, and things like that. And so rather than kind of uh making any kind of statements as to what those numbers are you know those calculators are now readily available and you can do the calculations yourself that's true that's true and we in theory, we are over we're time honest. we are over time gentlemen we can uh, we're gonna have another webinar uh next month and i hope you all will join us okay really appreciate everybody oh. coming to this one you know spending some time with us learning new things catching up on the regulatory environment that's coming up here in just a few weeks is something we all got to do. And we so surely appreciate you joining us, Solus, along with Bill Brooks to, to uh, bring you, we hope, some informational and, and hopefully uh, profitable information for you going forward. Have a great day and a nice holiday, everyone. And we look forward to visiting with you on our next web webinar starting in January. Bill? Happy holidays. Take care. Thanks, everybody.